Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer. I'm the Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And today's show is all about generative AI, which I know is a shocker because nobody's talking about that. Ha ha. Um, but we're talking about Gen AI and the role technology can play in AI application performance, risk management, and along the way, um, reduction of compute costs, which is something that a lot of people are thinking about these days. My guest today is Manoj Saxena. Manoj is the founder and the chairman of a company called Trustwise. And Trustwise is officially launching this week with some seed funding and it's um, in its flagship product, which is an API-based Gen AI performance and risk management solution that developers, that enterprise developers can use to lower the cost and increase the safety of, as well as the green factor of the AI models that they're building and using. Manoj, I always stalk the LinkedIn profiles of my guests in advance of the show. And I have to admit, I love the way you described yourself. And in your LinkedIn profile, you said it really simply. You said, I like building things, going fast, and helping brilliant people build great companies. I love that. I feel like I've kind of spent my career doing that. So that really resonated with me. Um, what we don't have in common is that you were the first GM of IBM Watson. And as I mentioned, you're now the founder and the chairman of TrustRise. You're the founder of the Responsible AI Institute, which is focused on driving the adoption of responsible AI through independent AI conformity assessments and certification. And last but not least, you're the holder of, I don't know, a paltry 34 software patents in AI and web services. There's no small, no small accomplishments there. Welcome to the program, Manoj. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. Absolutely. Well, I've been looking forward to it. I know today's a big day for you. So before we get started talking about TrustWise News, I want to give you an note. So I've you you sat through an introduction and me kind of talking about your career, your bio, and that sort of thing. And I would love to hear from you. Um, just something about your your career journey, how you you know kind of what you've what you've done along the way that might be something that's a little unexpected. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, TrustWise uh, is my sixth startup. So you could officially give me a masochist uh, certificate. Uh, I've had <laughs> the fortune of uh, building and selling four companies. One was a complete wipeout. And uh, so I love building things, like I said before. And uh, when you look back at my life, you know, back when I was in my 20s, um, being an entrepreneur was the last thing on my uh, plans. I never imagined myself as an entrepreneur. And I was a professional, you know, I, I was born into a family where my mother was a doctor, my father was a captain of police. And to me, it was all about getting a professional job. And uh, so my entrepreneurial um, streak started back in the college days when I was dating um, my fiance, who then became my wife. Um, and we were in this remote campus about 300 miles from a big city. And she would refuse to allow me to buy her dinner. She said, you know, this is your parents' money. This is my, I'm like 18. And so I had to find ways uh, while staying on a campus. Uh, and I came up with this idea of selling photographs. This is before iPhones to yeah. the new incoming um, students for a, a massive price because no one had cameras back then. So that's the money I made as an entrepreneur. I learned the whole art of finding a product niche, fulfilling it, delivering it, and then taking the profits to take your fiance out for a date. So that's how I got going as an entrepreneur. Necessity is the mother of invention, so they say. Indeed it is. <laughs> well, and I do know that one other thing that you're incredibly passionate about might have something to do with that going fast um, part of your bio that you mentioned. Do you want to touch on that part of your passion? Yeah, you know, so I love racing cars. I mean, yeah. and I have this 85-year-old car um, that's only about 22 of them, and I, you know, drive long distance uh, races. And I call merit racing my meditation in motion. My daughter likes to, I have two daughters and one of them likes to say that I have like a million tabs open in my brain at a given time. Yes. When I'm doing these 25, 35 day long races, um, that's the only time all those tabs are shut down and I'm focused on one thing. So right now I'm driving from uh, Alaska to Argentina and I finished about two thirds of that. And my goal is to sort of go around the world this way and, and longitudinally and latitudinally. So 
uh, racing to me is very pure. It's uh, something that allows you to understand how well you're doing, allows you to also enjoy the journey and uh, not think about too many things. So it's my reset. And it's um, uh, I have done things around my uh, you know family foundation and philanthropy where I've raised money through my races. So that's the fun uh, part of my life, I guess. I love that. Well, I have to say that my activity that shuts down the browser tabs and I have at least as many open at any given time is gardening. And so when I'm out there and I'm up to my elbows in the dirt and I'm thinking about, you know, what things look like visually and what I can move and what I need to add and everything else, it's just an all consuming thing. But I call it my therapy. So yeah. so I very much understand. So let's talk a little bit about um your passion for responsible AI. You've got a ton of experience with AI, likely more than many of us. And, you know, I'd love to hear from you about why you're such a believer in champion uh, responsible AI. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for asking that. I mean, responsible AI is my life's work. Um, that uh, I tell my daughters, that's the card that will go in my coffin. That's the part about this nonprofit yeah. that I started eight years ago. When I was running IBM Watson, I realized the power, um, the double-edged nature of the power of these technologies when we were applying it for cancer and one of the um, audience members accused me of, you know, playing, uh, he, he called it a death panel machine with his wife's cancer. And fortunately he had a spouse who had a third stage breast cancer. And he said, these machines are not explainable and you are now giving it to cancer specialists to solve cancer. And that true literally took and changed the direction of my life. But I started realizing that we are now dealing with the technology that is exponential in nature. What the industrial age did for our arms and legs, AI is gonna do for our minds and our skills. And um, started realizing that if left to technology companies alone, um, you know, it is it, it could be put to wrong use or harmful use. Yeah. So the way out of it to me was to create a nonprofit that's sort of like a JD powers of AI. Yeah. In and do an independent assessment and benchmarking and certification. And that's how I got going on that journey. And uh, on a business side, I think people are now beginning to realize that responsible AI is profitable AI. And yeah. uh, the fact that if you do it the right way, you can enhance your brand, you can enhance customer service and trust. And um, we were a little too early eight years ago, but um, yeah. very proud of the team. We grew like 400% last year, a community of about 30,000 people who are all committed to applying this technology in a safe and reliable and societally beneficial way. And this conversation has really taken off since the launch of ChatGPT a couple of years ago. So uh, it is something that will be, uh, I hope, what I will be known for as my contribution um, you know, to this earth for the time I'm here. Well, I will say this. I think it's impressive that as long ago as eight years, which seems like a very long time in tech lives, right? That you were already thinking about the need for responsible AI and creating the Responsible AI Institute. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that is futuristic thinking that says a lot about, you know, kind of where your brain is. And I like that. So my question, though, uh, here is these independent AI conformity assessments and certification that you do, is that something that that people can go to the AI Responsible AI Institute and and do? Or is it something they have to pay for? How does that work? Yeah, so absolutely. And thanks for asking. So we provide these three products. We call, we call it ABC, you know, assessments, benchmarks, and certifications. Okay. So we are a membership-driven model. We are a global nonprofit, and we have some amazing companies um, who are members. So it's an annual fee that you pay. And in return, you get access to all our tools. Um, there's a community of about 30,000 people. Okay. And you also get X number of free hours a year along with that membership. So you can use it for education or you can use it for assessments and benchmark and certification. Awesome. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So I know that you've talked before about what you call the AI risk trifecta. That trifecta is comprised of costs, risk, and environment. Talk with me a little bit, if you would, about your thinking about these risks and, and the challenges you see that customers are having on these fronts. Yeah, so I sort of break the AI world into pre-chat GPT and post-chat GPT. I mean, having been someone who was in the industry, if you were to ask me five years ago, do you think we would be at the point we are in terms of accessibility of AI through a chat interface and the power of these models? 
I would have said we are at least 10 years away from it. So I'm it's myself incredible. blown away by how fast things have come about. Yeah. And commensurate with this uh, amazing technology, you know, like transformer models and foundation models and uh, the back propagation and all these capabilities is the other two dimensions of these technologies. One, that they are incredibly expensive to build and run. Right. Um, you know, the projections are that today data centers consume about two and a half percent of American electricity by as soon as 2030, end of this decade, that number could be as high as 25 percent of all of electricity going into data centers for powering these AI models. That's crazy. Um, and, and that's just insane, right? And a typical yeah. AI model generates as much carbon emission as five American cars over their lifetime. And yeah. people are going to have tens of thousands of these things. So um, there are these this this aspect of societal impact and environmental impact that I consider still to be a part of responsible AI. Yeah. And then there are these other aspects of self-learning. So these systems, as they start learning, they could also propagate you know, biases. They could uh, propagate mistakes if the, you don't have the right guardrails in place. Right. So the three big issues that I see companies who are trying to pilot uh, GPT-like technology are number one, they're trying to make sure that they're safe and they can be aligned to the regulations. So that's the safety um, uh, try, you know, requirement. Right. The second requirement is that they are sustainable in terms of uh, environmental impact and financial impact. A cost of these models, a single GPT query costs 36 times as much as a search query on Google. And it can consume as much as a thousand times more power yeah. than a search query. So there's a whole aspect around the cost of these things. And then the third and final one is how do I make sure that there is um, um, you know, alignment and compliance with the various regulations that are coming on? So cost, compliance, and sustainability is the trifecta that I talk about um, right. that comes to now. As they're finished doing these pilots, uh, CFOs are getting involved and saying, okay, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, <laughs> yeah. Where are the dollars? And uh, show me the yeah. ROI. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this leads us to your big news of the week. So it's a very big week for TrustWise. The company just closed a 4 million seed funding round and you've officially launched Optimize AI. Talk with me a little bit about what Optimize AI is and why this solution is kind of the thing. I, I look at it and sort of see it as the right solution at the right time. Tell us more. Yeah, thank you, and um, and I'm very proud of this team. So for the last two years, we've been building TrustWise um, in collaboration with highly one of the most highly regulated companies in the world, so insurance companies, banks, and healthcare. So over the last two years, we have essentially studied the problem of how do you take a generative AI system and a large language model into a high stakes environment, and how do you get business value out of it? And what we found is that there are three big issues that companies are struggling with before they could scale generative AI. So I call it the chat GPT moment versus the OO moment. So initially everyone got excited and now they're saying, well, it's not that easy to bring in these technologies in the enterprise because of three things. One, they need to make sure that the output is not hallucinating and the output is not leaking sensitive data. Two, that they need to make sure that the output of an LLM is aligned with their business policies and the regulations. And three, that they need to make sure that the cost of delivering these things, both financially and environmentally, is sustainable. Right. So using those three problems, we came up with TrustWise as an application performance management and risk management system for generative AI, uh, very much similar to what App Dynamics does or a, a New Relics does for the uh, you know, cloud-centered and the microservices center, but we do that for Gen AI. And the focus is to just provide a single API that can fit into any AI tool chain and can work with any model in any cloud or a laptop-based environment, mm -hmm. almost serve like a spell checker, um, like a trust checker. You yeah. know, is it cost-effective, is it safe, and is it compliant? So that's the product we are launching. And I believe there's an opportunity to build a generational company here much like Norton Antivirus defined the cybersecurity space, yeah. I believe TrustWise is going to define the cyber safety and trust space. So yeah. think of us as a safety as a service or a trust as a service company. You know, I'm thinking, I'm listening to you talk, and I'm thinking about how this, to me, sounds a lot like Grammarly and how Grammarly, you know, when you're a Grammarly customer, and I, I always laugh when I talk about this because um, I, I'm 
I spend most of my career writing and I'm a really good writer and I'm a really good editor. And it never occurred to me that Grammarly would help me be a better writer. And then I started working with Grammarly and I started using their solution. And it just like what you're talking about, it's there behind yep. everything that I'm doing on any device that I'm, you know, whether it's my phone, I'm sending a text message or my laptop or my desktop, and it's just there helping me. So yep. I, I kind of see this working in that way. That's a great analogy. I think yeah. all workflows are going to have generative AI woven into it, right? Yeah. Writing content or supporting claims or doing clinician practices or discovering drugs. Yeah. AI is going to be woven into every business process. Yeah. And think of Trustwise almost like, if Grammarly and HTTPS had a baby, right? So, <laughs> so, so think about like this guardrails that are already guiding you on that particular prompt. Yeah. You know, is it safe? Is it compliant? Is it cost effective? So how do you do that so that every prompt can be optimized? And that's the problem that we're going after, which I believe will be as pervasive as a web page call and an HTTPS is. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I think it sounds great. So talking about regulations and policies, I mean, today we have the EU's AI Act and we have NIST and we have Responsible AI Institute and we've got the RAISE safety and alignment benchmarks and we've got the, uh, the SCI ISO software carbon intensity standard. And really, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the reality of it is governmental agencies and organizations are scrambling just like the rest of us are, but they're trying to get arms around regulations and policies and guardrails and things to try to protect users and businesses and that sort of thing. So talk with me a little bit, if you would, about how Trustwise Optimize AI can actually help organizations with regard to the adherence to global AI standards and policies and regulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. So you know, a lot of talk today is given about hallucinations and data leakage. And I think that's an important problem to solve, but not enough attention is given to the other big problem, which is alignment. How do you make sure that the output of every prompt that you're putting into your system is aligned to three things? That is aligned to your own corporate values and your corporate communication strategy. So there are banks who say, our tone has to be of a 10th grader or below. It needs to be this way. So how do you make sure that the AI understands the corporate AI use policy and corporate communication policies? So that's one part, is alignment of the AI output to corporate requirements. Second is alignment of AI to regulatory requirements for a given industry. So EU AI Act, NIST, and, and so on and so forth. And third is alignment of AI to the end customer that you're dealing with. So UK has this regulation called the FCA Consumer Duty Regulation that says if you're a bank and you're dealing with an 85-year-old pensioner versus a 21-year-old college kid, the tone and clarity and understandability of your AI's output has to be different. Yeah. Today, there is no technology that exists that can help people steer the output of an LLM. And that's the second problem that we solve, which is around making sure the outputs are safe, Second, making sure the outputs are compliant and are targeted, almost personalized to the end users. And third, making sure that you're delivering those at the cheapest financial cost and environmental cost. That trifecta is where uh, Trustwise exists. Yeah, well, that makes that makes perfect sense and really adds a lot to the overall value proposition, I think. Thank right? you. <laughs> so there are some... Customers love the returns and the ROIs that they're getting. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think that that's a very big deal. And that's really where everyone is, I think, on these on their respective AI journeys today is, you know, really, you know, it's funny. Those of us in the industry talk about AI and Gen AI and how quickly it's, you know, the last year has gone and the great strides that we've seen and everything else. But the reality of it is uh, adoption is pretty low. And mm -hmm. a lot of that is because organizations are still trying to figure it out. You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, what are the right guardrails and what are the right policies? And many of them are just using the let's block it all strategy. But the reality of it is blocking it all doesn't really help because then you've got people who have these <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, uh -huh. so anyway, it is a very challenging time um, and solutions like this, I think that, you know, really help with 
adherence to those global standards and policies and regulations go a long way toward making that lift quite not quite as heavy. Yep. And I think that's what people are looking for. So there are, let's talk climate change for a second. And I think this is really an important part of, of TrustWise and Optimize AI. So there are some very real challenges. You touched on, touched on this at the beginning of our conversation, um, but the challenges for organizations who are adopting AI, and they're still trying to meet their climate change goals. But yep. this is an expensive journey, and this is an expensive compute <laughs> journey. So can you share with me a little bit about how TrustWise's Optimize AI AI can help manage that load and, and help companies balance what they want to accomplish with AI with, you know, they're helping to meet their climate goals? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I was mentioning earlier, IT sustainability or AI impact and IT impact on sustainability goals is going to become a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. Right now, it's more things like supply chain decarbonization, but IT decarbonization is quickly coming up on the agenda. Right. Where people, as they look at the carbon footprints and the energy footprints and the water footprints of uh, some of these data centers that are used to uh, train these models, is massive. The part that people don't understand yet is the numbers that we are seeing today are only numbers for building a model, right? But <laughs> tuning and inferencing yeah. from that model can actually be four times more than building the models. So the numbers we are seeing today is just to build a model. But when you tune the model and inference the model, these go four times bigger. And companies who are looking ahead, they're saying, well, we need to start making sure that this aligns with our corporate sustainable AI policy. So Lloyds Bank, which is one of our you know, charter customers, uh, their sustainability group is working with their insurance group, working with the CDAOS office and the responsible AI and ethics office and saying, how do we make sure that as we start finishing prototyping, these projects, as we start scaling them, that we are doing it in a way that we can measure and decarbonize these use cases. So what TrustWise does is we have a layer of software that optimizes. Think of it almost like uh, like what WinZip does for your video files, like a video compressor. Yeah. We would do that for, so we, we do that at three layers. One is we help you select the right LLM, or the right language model itself, based on the carbon footprint of it, as well as the financial cost of it. Second, we start using um, sub separate compression techniques to start adjusting the pipeline settings, things like you know retrieval, uh, augmented generation pipelines, things right. like chunk size. So we would actually configure the pipeline in a way that it uses less compute, uh, not just the model. And then the third one, if we start helping you select the right endpoint, whether it's a cloud endpoint or a data server or a processor card. So we have these energy and carbon maps uh, working with the Green Software Foundation, where we have a whole library of data sets that tells you that if you're running an insurance policy generative AI application, run it in Ireland and Poland, as well as in Southern London, and it'll give you this type of a carbon footprint. But if you change the Ireland endpoint to a data center or to an NVIDIA processor, you can reduce your carbon by 28%. So it's that type of uh, red teaming that we do for a design. And you know, red teaming has been used in safety and cybersecurity for the longest time. Yeah. We're using red teaming for design of optimized AI systems where we are telling companies for your given AI workload, this is the right configuration for the best safety, best alignment, lowest financial cost, and the smallest carbon footprint. So it sounds to me, Manoj, that a good time to be checking out and perhaps exploring um, Optimize AI is at the very beginning of your journey. No, absolutely. So we you know Optimize AI as an API can yeah. be involved in three different places. It could be used in the beginning to design your AI itself. Right, so right. it or as you're getting ready to deploy your AI system after you have built it, you can do a quality check against your carbon footprint, your cost footprint, and the regulatory environment because regulations are changing all right. the time so maybe six months from now once you started designing it if it's changing you could call that spell checker and make sure am i still compliant with the uai yeah. am i still compliant with nist yeah. uh, and am i still using the best model for it and then the third place where we use it is after you're running it for a few months or a year um, you want to see if there is a drift in the model performance or in the data or in the safety so we could be used you know design time it can be used right before deployment time Mm -hmm. And it could be used for continuous monitoring 
right. to watch for drifts and uh, optimization opportunities. Yeah, I think that what I'm thinking of is that, you know, so much of our research shows that, you know, people are stealing data or stealing a budget from other departments to fund their AI initiatives. And as we know, this is expensive. And so what I'm thinking when I'm listening to you is that, you know, part of the part of what TrustWise Optimize AI does is it sort of it, it extends a helping hand to help you on your journey. So rather than being taken by surprise, as you start to figure this out, you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. You've got a vendor partner that can work right alongside you and help every step of the way. But the other thing I think, I feel like I'm hearing is that it can save you from, you know, the surprise of a bigger than expected compute bill, because, you know, how do we know what this stuff is going to cost until we do it? Yeah, you know, absolutely. so it's, it seems to me like there's a big safety net there all across the board that TrustWise and Optimize AI provide. No, thank you. Thank you for calling that out. And I think what we are seeing is, and, and there was a survey that just came out last month, that as people start finishing up their prototypes and their pilots, it's been yeah. you know, almost a year and a half since ChatGPT got launched. And there, were, uh, there was one large company, a multinational, who told me we have over 100 use cases that we have prototyped using Gen AI, but we have no idea how safe they are and we have no idea how much they will cost. And they know that by the end of the year, the CFO's office is going to come calling and saying, <laughs> Okay, so tell us what's the business value, what's the yeah. ROI, and tell us if the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah. This is yeah. where I think a tool like Optimize AI is going to help them take their use cases and their prototypes and start helping them compress the cost, yeah. improve the safety, compress the carbon footprint, so they can make more systematic decisions of which ones to fund and which ones to scale. Yeah. And the survey that I was referring to said that just in the last year, cost of AI has grown up by a factor of 14X. So last year, the same survey when it was done, only 3% were concerned about the cost of AI. Now that number is 14 times higher. So yeah. we are being in step with the market as the customers are learning from Gen AI and putting that yeah. into production. We are with them to help guide them to make outcome-driven financial decisions. You know, and, and what else I like here is that, you know, anybody that's been involved in this space for any length of time knows that um, integrating AI and Gen AI into business operations um, is something that is not just an IT decision, you know? It's a decision that, generally speaking, really should start in the boardroom, but it's a decision that legal impacts and finance impacts yeah, and, you know, business leaders, different stakeholders throughout the organization, well beyond just IT. So it seems to me that this solution actually, you know, really checks the box for the variety of things, the different stakeholders in these decisions and in getting to the bottom line, which is what is our ROI here and what are we going to do moving forward and, and that sort of thing. So I get it. Now, thank you for calling it out, because I think in addition to the API, we have this thing called a command center. So there are three lines of defenses in a company. There is IT and business, there is risk and compliance, and there is audit. What the TrustWise API command center does is for each of these lines of defenses, it gives you a view into the performance of the system and the compliance of the system or the cost effectiveness of the system. So that's the other part in which we have designed the API is to say different people should get a view of how the AI system is operating. But uh, thanks for calling that out. It's a key yeah. part of the non-functional property of what we provide. Yeah, well I, well, I get it. Well, Manoj, thank you so much for spending time with me today and to our viewing and listening audience. That's a wrap for this episode of The Security Angle. Again, Manoj Saxena from TrustWise um, has been here talking about TrustWise's Optimize AI. I'm so looking forward to watching and continuing to track your progress, of course, and wish you the best of luck. And for our viewers and listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Silica, or Security Angle on the Cube, your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. And if you've not yet hit that subscribe button, there's no time like the present. And we'll see you here next time. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure.